we can get an idea of how tameness, or anything else, can be sculpted, naturally or artificially, by looking at a fascinating experiment of modern times on the domestication of Russian silver foxes for use in the fur trade. It is doubly interesting because of the lessons it teaches us, over and above what Darwin knew, about the domestication process, about the side effects of selective breeding, and about the resemblance, which Darwin well understood, between artificial and natural selection. The silver fox is just a colour variant, valued for its beautiful fur, of the familiar red fox, Valpis Valpis. The Russian geneticist Dmitry Belayev was employed to run a fox fur farm in the 1950s. He was later sacked because his scientific genetics conflicted with the anti-scientific ideology of Lysenko, the charlatan biologist who managed to capture the ear of Stalin and so take over and largely ruin all of Soviet genetics and agriculture for some 20 years. Belayev retained his love of foxes and of true Lysenko-free genetics and he was later able to resume his studies of both as director of an institute of genetics in Siberia. Wild foxes are tricky to handle, and Belayev set out deliberately to breed for tameness. Like any other animal or plant breeder of his time, his method was to exploit natural variation, no genetic engineering in those days, and choose for breeding those males and females that came closest to the ideal he was seeking. In selecting for tameness, Belayev could have chosen for breeding those dogs and bitches that most appealed to him or looked at him with the cutest facial expressions. That might well have had the desired effect on the tameness of future generations. More systematically than that, however, he used a measure that was pretty close to the flight distance just mentioned in connection with wild wolves, but adapted for cubs. Belayev and his colleagues and successors for the experimental program continued after his death, subjected fox cubs to standardised tests in which an experimenter would offer a cub food by hand while trying to stroke or fondle it. The cubs were classified into three classes. Class three cubs were those that fled from or bit the person. Class two cubs would allow themselves to be handled but showed no positive responsiveness to the experimenters. Class one cubs, the tamest of all, positively approached the handlers, wagging their tails and whining. When the cubs grew up, the experimenters systematically bred only from this tamest class. After a mere six generations of this selective breeding for tameness, the foxes had changed so much that the experimenters felt obliged to name a new category, the domesticated elite class, which were eager to establish human contact, whimpering to attract attention and sniffing and licking experimenters like dogs. At the beginning of the experiment, none of the foxes were in the elite class. After ten generations of breeding for tameness, 18% were elite. After twenty generations, 35%. And after 30 to 35 generations, domesticated elite individuals constituted between 70 and 80% of the experimental population. Such results are perhaps not too surprising, except for the astonishing magnitude and speed of the effect. Thirty-five generations would pass unnoticed on the geological timescale. Even more interesting, however, were the unexpected side effects of the selective breeding for tameness. These were truly fascinating and genuinely unforeseen. Darwin, the dog lover, would have been entranced. The tame foxes not only behaved like domestic dogs, they looked like them. They lost their foxy pelage and became piebald black and white like Welsh collies. Their foxy prick ears were replaced by doggy floppy ears. Their tails turned up at the end like a dog's, rather than down like a fox's brush. The females came on heat every six months like a bitch, instead of every year like a vixen. According to Belayev, they even sounded like dogs. These dog-like features were side effects. Belayev and his team did not deliberately breed for them, only for tameness. Those other dog-like characteristics seemingly rode on the evolutionary coattails of the genes for tameness. To geneticists, this is not surprising. They recognize a widespread phenomenon called pleiotropy, whereby genes have more than one effect, seemingly unconnected. The stress is on the word seemingly. Embryonic development is a complicated business. 
as we learn more about the details, that seemingly unconnected turns into connected by a route that we now understand but didn't before. Presumably, genes for floppy ears and piebald coats are pleiotropically linked to genes for tameness, in foxes as well as in dogs. This illustrates a generally important point about evolution. When you notice a characteristic of an animal and ask what its Darwinian survival value is, you may be asking the wrong question. It could be that the characteristic you've picked out is not the one that matters. It may have come along for the ride, dragged along in evolution by some other characteristic to which it is pleiotropically linked. The evolution of the dog, then, if Coppinger is right, was not just a matter of artificial selection, but a complicated mixture of natural selection, which predominated in the early stages of domestication, and artificial selection, which came to the fore more recently. The transition would have been seamless, which again goes to emphasise the similarity, as Darwin recognised, between artificial and natural selection.